Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Lara Basilon. I am a professor of law, and I direct the Criminal and Juvenile and Racial Justice Clinics at the University of San Francisco School of Law. I'm so excited to be with you today moderating this program. We are joined by Mark Lamont Hill and Mitchell Plitnick to discuss their new book, Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics. Professor, commentator, activist, and television personality, Mark Lamont Hill is the Steve Charles Chair in Media Studies and Solutions at Temple University. His career has been dedicated to educational accessibility and youth engagement in civic duty. His co-author is political analyst and writer Mitchell Plitnick, founder of Rethinking Foreign Policy, a nonprofit dedicated to providing a clear lens into US foreign policy and promoting progressive change in foreign affairs. Mitchell has spoken all over the country on Middle East politics and has regularly offered commentary in a wide range of audio and television outlets. Their book, Except for Palestine, explores the role of the United States in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They argue that pro-Israeli policies go against our nation's anti-authoritarian values. To alleviate tensions, progressives in the U.S. must extend their beliefs of equality for all to Palestinians abroad. Except for Palestine is a searing critique for elected officials, activists, and everyday citizens to align their progressive beliefs and politics with their values. We're going to be covering a lot of ground in the next hour, but I want to ask your questions too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube and we will be getting to them later on in the program. Thank you and welcome to Mark Lamont Hill and Michelle Plitnick. Thanks for having us. Thanks, it's great to be here. So let's start with a short historical overview. The birth of Israel was predated by World War II and of course the horror of the Holocaust. In 1947, the UN adopted Resolution 101 which said that the country that had been Palestine, then under British colonial rule, would be divided into two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. The UN would then control the portion of Jerusalem that both sides laid claim to because of its religious significance. Arabs opposed Resolution 101, but Israel went forward with its Declaration of Independence in 1948. The next day, Israel was invaded by Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and Transjordan. During that ensuing war, Israel took over the territory that the UN resolution had originally assigned to the Palestinians. And 700,000 of the Palestinians, roughly speaking, fled their homes never to return. Many of them went to the West Bank and to the Gaza Strip. Hundreds of thousands lived permanently in refugee camps. This primal wound has festered ever since through wars and two intifadas. Your book starts with the near present as right-wing politicians gain descendancy in both Israel and in the United States with the Trump administration, and of course, Bibi Netanyahu. And I expected you to argue that Trump made a bad situation more toxic still, but you have a subtler point to make. You write that by taking actions like, for example, acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and supporting the move of the embassy there, Trump was simply saying the quiet part i.e. the part that other U.S. presidents had been whispering and progressives had endorsed out loud. Can you explain what you mean by that? And, and Mark, I'll, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I think that's, 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 that's an important point. And, and, and I think it's important to begin with that backdrop, that, that history, that historical analysis that begins um, in many ways, not even in 1947, which is, I believe, UN Resolution 181, um, and uh, or, or 101 in 1953, or even um, the beginning of World War II in 1939, but really uh, begins when we look at the first major wave of Zionist integration to what at the time was Ottoman Palestine um, 
1882 approximately. And we begin to see from that first Aliyah up until the moment we're at now, an ongoing struggle and battle uh, for freedom, for justice, for, for rights, for safety, for self-determination, for dignity. And all of that history is important because I think uh, too often we reduce this to a battle over religion, which it is not. That's not to say religion doesn't matter, right? The debates over the holy areas, the debates over um, over specifically uh, what to do with Aqsa, um, the, the, you know, all of these things are rooted in, in faith, to be sure. There are certainly religious claims about um, returning to Israel. There are certainly religious claims for Muslims about what, the, what, what Aqsa represents as the first uh, Qibla, uh, and as a site of all these mo extraordinary moments in Islamic history, al Israel, Miraj, et cetera. But at the core, that's not what it is. At the core, it's also not an intractable battle that's been going on forever, right? Which plays into these Orientalist ideas that brown people just fight and are barbaric and that they're not, it's not rooted in any specific land claims. Instead, this is an ongoing battle that is political, that is about power, that is about land, that is, it's, and, and, and it's one that we have to take very seriously. And I think that when we have too flat of an analysis of the American government's role in it, you know, where there's good guys and bad guys, like it's an episode of, you know, pro wrestling or something, then what you end up with is Trump as the boogeyman and, and, and Trump as the interruption to otherwise even headed, even handed rather, uh, level headed American policy that might not be perfect, but ultimately is trying to advance a, a democratic goal. But when we subject that claim to any kind of scrutiny, what we instead see is that there's been a kind of bipartisan consensus uh, on of indifference uh, to the to in many ways to the legitimacy of Palestinian claims of self determination. Um, there's been a refusal a refusal to take Palestinian claims uh, seriously and to respond even handily to to their needs. And so, Trump, you're right. It's not just that Trump took a bad situation and made it worse. In many ways, Trump becomes a shield. Trump can become a distraction to a set of policies that have never served the interests of Palestinian people and sometimes have been at their worst under democratic regimes. I'll give you one example, and, and I know Mitchell has so much to say about this as well. Um, the Jerusalem Embassy Act is, is, a, is a classic, is, is, is a perfect example of this, right? Uh, when Trump decides to move the embassy in 2018, um, after gesturing to it, uh, you know, the year before, when he moves the, the, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, he is sending a signal, and he very openly and unequivocally says that he recognizes Jerusalem as the undivided capital of Israel. He is trying to push the Jerusalem question off the table rather than allowing it to be a final status issue. He is um, contravening international law he is going against convention. But this didn't start with Trump. The Jerusalem Embassy Act was signed in 1995. Uh, we had a Democratic president who wasn't fighting to veto this bill and who was trying to show he could get tough on Palestinians too. Um, we, we've seen Democratic president after Democratic president and Republican after Republican essentially sign a waiver of this bill every six months, which essentially means we've all, we, we've, America already said the embassy's moving. Most most presidents just afraid to own it. What Trump did was Trump is American policy on steroids. He said, you know what, I'm going to own it. I'm going to be the ugly enforcer of a policy that's already been here. When we understand it in those terms, it gives us a, it gives us a present day analysis to go to the backdrop that connects to the backdrop that you talked about, right? From the partition plans to um, to and not just the UN, not just not just one, not just 181, but also going back to the Peel Partition, going back even further to all the attempts of the British and the U.S. to intervene in these moments, largely driven out of self-interest, not any 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 commitment to a lasting peace for everyone. Mitchell, I wanted to give you a chance to to add anything that you wanted to say to this before I move on to my next question. So, I mean, I think Mark really covered a lot of it. One one thing I would I would sort of to throw in there is, you know, the, the historical uh, backdrop that we are writing this against goes back much farther than 1948, right? It goes back 
Um, it goes back really to the 19th century and the budding at that time of both. Uh, uh, I think, well, we frequently talk about the, the uh, beginnings of Zionism at the end of that century, but a bit earlier, it was actually also the beginnings of Palestinian nationalism, uh, which ended up growing, of course, in uh, in constant tension and relation to Zionism for you know, obvious reasons on the ground. But um, that is the essence of what this issue is really about. It's two national movements, one of them um, which was already there at that point, uh, the other which felt a very strong connection but was not for the most part, uh, except for you know, a small number of, uh, of Jews, who, most of whom did not support the Zionist movement, uh, most of whom were outside of that area and then came in uh, and, and certainly you know, I, I know that many people debate the issue of settler colonialism and whether that applies to Israel, but it's it's indisputable that the methods and the actual actions were that. Um, you know, the 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 underlying terminology can you know is debated. I I think it it it's correctly applied, but um, but there's no question that that is physically what happened. So that's where a conflict sort of starts. And I think it's also important when we're talking about this and talking about how Trump, uh, you know, certainly Mark and I spent a lot of time in the book explaining how Trump was uh, uh, just an extreme version of uh, longstanding American policy who threw caution to the wind and abandoned a lot of the more pragmatic uh, sort of reining in that previous presidents had done. Um, when we look at that, we have to remember that all along, whether it was the United States and before the United States, the British, um, there has been uh, um, a the, the, there have been maybe some political vagaries in how much support the pre-state Zionist movement had from the British, uh, how much support the United States gave, certainly in the early days to Israel as opposed to later on. But there has been a pretty consistent line of those imperial powers not uh, protecting the rights of Palestinians. And that is a really, really important thing for us to look at. And it comes back to our central argument. And it's why um, uh, uh, the idea of Trump not being a departure from U.S. policy, but rather just a more extreme version of it is so central to the argument that um, that the support for uh, for moves that do not take into account and do not account for and do not even tolerate in many cases Palestinian rights, let alone Palestinian equality, uh, is just anathema, should be anathema to progressive values. And, you know, we're, we're trying to make the point that unfortunately it is in practice not treated that way. So speaking of going back in history, threaded throughout your book is this loaded phrase, Israel's right to exist as a nation state. You write that that question is long settled and that keeping it alive and using it as a rallying cry is a cynical response that, quote, is disingenuously used to frame the case for Palestinian rights as the denial of Jewish self-determination or worse, as a call for anti-Semitism. But what many Jews feel, I think, is the shadow of history. So as Amos Oz wrote about Zionism, this idea that being Jewish isn't just a religion, but it's a nationality and the basis for being a nation state, he wrote, it has the justness of a drowning man who clings to the only plank that he can. And the drowning man clinging to this plank is allowed by all rules of natural, objective, universal justice to make room for himself on that plank, even though in doing so, he must push others to the side a little. And I think what he's getting at is centuries of the Jewish people being hunted down, massacred, and under Hitler, you know, murdered by the millions. And so for a significant segment of the Jewish population, this threat of non-existence is always there. And Israel is the bulwark against it. So given the history of the Jewish people, how do you respond to that? Mitch uh, yeah, um, I mean, it's a history that I know very well. Um, I, I was actually raised uh, uh, in the Orthodox community. So, you know, for the early years of my life, I was wearing a kippah. I was very uh, identifiably Jewish and uh, faced uh, anti-Semitic violence as a result. Um, you know, not only that, having grown up in New York um, in the 1970s, um, there were many Holocaust survivors around me. 
So it was something, you know, th- it, this is something that I'm, I'm very conscious of as well as being a longtime student of Jewish history and, and understanding that the Holocaust uh, was only the was only the culmination of many centuries of persecution of Jews, particularly in Europe. Um, in fact, um, I would even go a step further and say one of the reasons that Jews uh, reacted to the Holocaust wasn't only the scope of the genocide, which was massive and uh, and and unprecedented even for our history, uh, but also because. F- for the, traditionally, what had happened is when Jews face mounting persecution in a given place, wherever it may be, um, we would leave and we would go somewhere else and, um, you know, build a, a new community there. This was a very harsh thing. It's it certainly, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it had many difficulties and lots of blood was spilled as a result. But that's what we did. In the Holocaust, we could all of a sudden we couldn't do that. You know, the, the world closed its doors to us. And this, this matters. This is a very, very big deal. And I have, you know, uh, contended that, um, that this is not talked about enough, um, either by Jews or by uh, Palestinians uh, and, and the relative, you know, the, the two the supporting camps. And I think we need to think about that. I, I think there is a lot of validity to Jewish fear that, uh, that, that, you know, another Holocaust will happen. And again, we will have nowhere to go. That isn't actually a fear that existed before World War II. Fear of persecution, fear of genocide, that existed before World War II for us. Um, it did not, what did not exist was the idea that we would have nowhere to flee to, that a place like the United States, and, and let's be very specific here, that a place like the United States, where most of the able-bodied younger, you know, younger and, and, and grown men uh, were gone off to war, which, you know, created a dearth of not only labor, but skilled labor, and Jews from Europe were bringing that with them, and were still turned around. So these things all matter. It's a big deal. Um, but where I would take issue with Abbas uh, uh sort of allegory is um, we didn't just push someone else aside a little bit to hang on to that plank. Um, we uh, intentionally set up or I, I shouldn't say we, because many Jews opposed Zionism back then. And, you know, but, but the Zionist movement um, intentionally set up a political system that didn't just provide for Jewish security, it provided for Jewish rule. And it provided for um, a, a state that inherently pri- privileges Jews uh, above others and was dispossessing another people who were already there. You know, people can, can bring up all these issues about, well, how long were they there? They came during, it doesn't matter. First of all, it's not true. I mean, it, people have been there for many, many, many generations and centuries. Um, I, I recommend Norma Saleh's uh, book, uh, uh, recent book on the history of Palestine of 4,000 years. Um, he really delves into this question. But um, people were there. People had been there. And, and you know, I, I think to their credit, many people today who oppose, who consider themselves anti-Zionists, um, uh, have made the point that one of the reasons they back, and, and I want to be clear, I'm not a one-stater or two-stater. I, I believe that's up to Israelis and Palestinians, but many people who back a one-state solution talk about the need to accommodate the fact that, you know what, settlers may have been there, put, put there legally and all that. Some of them have been there now four or five generations. Um, you know, th- all of these things come together. And um, it was we cr- the the state that was created was created not to not only to save Jews but to have a place where Jews uh, were rule were rulers and and by definition and we can see this in the the writings of the pre-state writings of David Ben Gurion or of Yosef Weitz and and a lot of other Zionist thought leaders there was an intent to drive Palestinians out of that land one way or another. Um, so given all of that, it's not just a matter of pushing someone else uh, uh, over on the plank so that we can survive. There was more to it than that. And, the, and as the years have gone on and Israel has gotten more stable, instead of saying, OK, we have a state, it's been established. Now let's address Palestinian rights. Let's let's admit that 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 we you know, that that 
even if we feel like we were justified, uh, we did another people wrong. And let's see how we move forward and make up with that. It has been one refusal to do that after another, despite the fact that I know many people hear that and say, well, wait a minute, Israel made all these concessions. When you actually look at the historical record, that's not what happened. So, um, so, I, so yes, I, I think that it is true that a lot of this is motivated by, by legitimate Jewish fear. Um, based on horrifying experiences over many, many generations. But at some point, uh, we have to also, we have to stop and say, okay, you know, that's what happened. How do we make this right? How do we address the fact that that fear led us to do things that, um, that, that horribly damaged another people and caused death, destruction, and massive dispossession um, you know, we, we talk about the intractability of both sides. The way that that intractability gets broken is that the more powerful side, and that is indisputably Israel, um, says, OK, you know what? We need to find a way to make this right. And that doesn't happen on its own. That happens because of political pressure uh, from people who see the need to do that. And that's why, uh, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's heartening to see groups like, if not now, like Jewish Voice for Peace that are Jewish groups that are saying that this needs to happen. We also see some such groups in, in Israel and in the human rights community um, and, 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 you know, anarchists against the wall and other groups that, you know, the much smaller minority in Israel, but they're there. So there's some hope for that sort of thing moving forward. Mark, did you want to add anything? No, no, I, I think Mitchell hit the nail on the head. So I wanted to talk about, take you back, I guess, to, to 1983. I mean, I'm sorry, to 1993, to that famous handshake between Arafat and Rabin on the South Lawn with a very happy Bill Clinton. And this seemed like a positive turning point. There was this agreement by Israel to withdraw its military from Gaza and the West Bank and have the Palestinian government take control over the West Bank. And actually Arafat, Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres shared the Nobel Peace Prize for this. They got it the next year. How did this agreement, which seemed to hold so much promise unravel and become in the words of the scholar Salman Abu Sita, quote, a hoax intended to entrench the occupation, not remove it, Mark? You know, and, and we always got to be careful of those those Nobel Peace Prizes. I've seen between that and Time Person of the Year, man, we've had some we've had some doozies. Um, I think that um, the Oslo Accords, for some, were an earnest attempt at creating um, a pathway to a two state solution and creating um, peace, right? Because you got to remember the the first Intifada. Um, begins in 1987, and for some, it's Oslo um, that ends it. The others would say it, you know, ended sort of by 1991, and it was fading out. But either way, the, 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 these meetings um, and the ultimate Oslo Accords were a mechanism to produce some sense of peace and some kind of pathway to to, to a two-state solution. The idea was that the arrangement of power would be relatively short, you know, but instead of having a kind of five year deal that becomes, you know, a pathway toward Palestinian statehood, five years turns to seven. Now it's 2000, 2000 turns to 2010, 2010 turns to 2020, we're in 2021. And we're still living under the conditions of the Oslo Accords, which have only uh, emboldened uh, Israel to expand settlements. Um, it has not allowed for any authentic Palestinian rule. I mean, one of the one of the key provisions of the Oslo Accords were the division of of territory of the West Bank um, into areas A, B, and C. And the idea would be, of course, that Palestinians would have their own kind of complete rule, that Israelis would have their own complete rule in in, in area C, uh, and that there'd be shared rule as well. Um, and even in the spaces where Palestinians ostensibly have uh, both kind of civil and military control, where they're able to control every aspect of, of Ramallah, for example, or Al-Bere. Um, what we see in real life is continued collaboration and coordination uh, with Israel. We see Israel uh, essentially, I won't say running roughshod but o o over, over Palestinians, because that would understate the extent to which Palestinians are complicit in this, right? I mean, the, the Palestinian Authority also has um, a lot of blame to bear here, but ultimately, um, what we're seeing is an arrangement of power that, that, that hasn't yielded anything for Palestinians. 
but more checkpoints, uh, harder, uh, more difficult ability to maneuver, uh, more boundaries. Um, and, and now the kind of pretext and the kind of plausible deniability, as we've seen, just as an example, with the, uh, with the vaccinations, right? Now, all of a sudden, Palestinians in the West Bank aren't being vaccinated. And the Israeli government can say, well, wait a minute, the Oslo Accords say that, you know, that's Palestinians' job to do. Now, of course, um, if we subject that claim to any scrutiny, we realize it also actually doesn't suggest that, not for the kind of pandemic level crisis we're talking about. But even that kind of a, an argument can only happen when we have an arrangement where, we, where, we, where the Palestinian Authority, which was created under Oslo, um, can be seen as a legitimate power, as it should be, um, but isn't given the opportunity to thrive. We, we also, um, under these conditions, um, have seen, we saw the Palestinian Authority in many ways. Uh, there's two more things I, I, I want to say about this, actually. One is that, before I say that, let me, let me back up. Another thing is part of what we unfortunately saw was, a, in many ways, from what I've observed, is, is a kind of chipping away at a kind of a, a cohesive Palestinian nationalism. That's not to say that there isn't a Palestinian nationalism, but suddenly um, Palestinians living inside of Israel are, are, are understood in many ways to be a different matter than those who are living in, in the West Bank and those who are living in Gaza. And so part of it, now, of course, at, at, there are many Palestinians who argue that those boundaries don't matter, we're all Palestinian and, and that this is our mission, this is our project. But I'm saying that also in many ways help to divide um, the Palestinian um, nationalist movement by reframing the struggle as, as, as one of, of only the West Bank, as, as one of only Gaza, and not thinking about those who live inside of Israel. Um, what we also saw was the Palestinian Authority in many ways bend over backwards to accommodate. I mean, we, you, you mentioned the right to exist question. Um, one of the things that we've seen, and you alluded to this yourself, Lara, is that, is that the is that Palestinians have consistently acknowledged Israel's right to exist. Um, you know, um, in 1988, um, Yasser Arafat very clearly uh, did so. The Palestinian Declaration of Independence clearly does so, in my estimation. Um, but to the extent that there was any confusion, Arafat comes back the next day and says, hey, I, I, I acknowledge this thing happened. Um, I acknowledge this thing is real. And by this thing, I, I'm, I'm referring to the arrangement. Um, for those you know, looking to pick apart what I'm saying, when I say th this thing, I'm talking about the political arrangement. They're saying that two state solution exists yeah, and, 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 and they're, declar they're declaring the existence of, or the need for the existence and the need for a Palestinian state in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and quite implicitly is acknowledging the territorial boundaries and integrity of the Israeli state based on the pre-1967 lines. That's what it seems to be arguing. Um, some would say, yeah, but there can be confusion, you know, what, what, what the border. So he comes back the next day and is very explicit about it. And then when you come to Oslo, they, they, the Palestinians paid a pretty high price, you know, they, they not, you know, in terms of even the letters of mutual recognition. Um, a price that, that Israel didn't pay. They simply recognized the PLO as representatives of the Palestinian people. They didn't recognize Palestinians' right to exist. They didn't recognize... Uh, the right to, to self-determination of the Palestinian people. Why is this important? Well, because it's another example of how the Oslo Accords, in many ways, on their face, look like a legitimate peace deal that was going to get us somewhere. But in reality, um, in many ways, further compromised Palestinian leadership. Um, and so now we have 20 years later, more than 20 years later, um, 27 years later, 28 years later, we have a Palestinian authority um, and a Fatah party that continues to rule without a mandate. Um, under extraordinary conditions of oppression. So I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to establish equivalency between the PA and the Israeli government. There, there are huge power dynamics here that are very different. But what I am saying is that Oslo has been a disaster for, for everybody who's not interested in settlement expansion and oppressing Palestinian people. Mitchell, I want you to weigh in, but I also want to pick up on a point that Mark made and ask you to respond directly to this in the context of answering my question, which is you and Mark both pose this rejoinder about the right to resist. Does Palestine as a nation state for a dispossessed stateless people have a right also to exist? And picking up on Mark's point, why isn't that question asked with the same frequency and why doesn't it carry the same moral weight? So um, I would say, first of all, on, on that specific question, um, I would say it does carry the same moral weight um, in the sense that if we are saying that we are granting uh, 
nations who have a connection to that land a right to a state, which is not axiomatic, by the way. Uh, Peter Beinart re recently wrote a very, very good piece about how there are many nations that do not have a state in this world, including some that are within other, you know, that live within other states. The United States is far from an exception. We have a number of nations who live in the United States. Uh, and who were here before us, who are fir First Nations, and they do not have a state. They may have some limited autonomy, but they do not have a state. Um, we can, you know, we can talk about Kurds. We can talk about Catholic. There, there's many examples of of such people. So it's not axiomatic that uh, the fact that you have a le legitimate national existence means that you're entitled to a state. Those, that's a, a leap that has to be made. And I'm not sure that anyone is actually, quote unquote, entitled to a state. States don't exist because of rights. They don't exist because of entitlement. They exist because of power. And they exist because other states acknowledge their territorial integrity and sovereignty. Um, so all that, you know, all that being said, um, I think there are any number of, of you know, of, of issues and, and paths that Palestinians may decide to take as a nation, just as Jews. Jews can have a national existence uh, and, and not necessarily support it uh, in, in terms of a state. Uh, the Bund existed. It did not support Zionism. It did not support uh, the, the creation of a Jewish state, but it was certainly a national Jewish movement. Uh, it was wiped out in the Holocaust, but for the most part. But um, there have been other Jewish national uh, traditions besides political Zionism as well. So, um, you know, so I, I guess I would, on, on some level, I would initially just challenge the whole question of, is there any sort of right to exist for any state? Um, if we, as uh, if the Israeli people, the Palestinian people, and the international community decide, as at one time it seemed like they had, that the way forward here is two states, then, you know, how can one make a legitimate case that, um, that Israel is entitled to exist and Palestine is not? I, I don't see, certainly, I don't see the ethical uh, uh, calculus that leads there, and I don't see a practical calculus that leads there, other than the one that says might makes right, and we have the situation that we do right now. Um, so I think um, I, I think that's a really important uh, an important way to look at it. And, and again, I come back to the question of a power imbalance. When I was a, uh, a thirty year old undergrad um, in, back in the nineteen nineties, I did a um, a special project that was assigned by one of my mentors, which was to go through every single page and every single line of the Oslo Accords, read it all and give a, a, a summary and a report. And one of the things I recognized at that point, um, having read it all, was that I said that one of the first things I said was this cannot possibly work. It can't. And the reason it couldn't is not because there can't be a two state solution. That two state solution that was envisioned was so out of balance um, first of all, Oslo did not promise a two-state solution. Oslo made no guarantees of a Palestinian state. It made no guarantees of Palestinian independence. It provided very little restraint on Israeli behavior, and it was wide open to spoilers on both sides, frankly. Um, it was clearly very vulnerable to militant violence, as we saw in 1996 right away, you know, just, just after the Oslo Accords were enacted. And, and um, the Palestinian Authority was created, Hamas went on a, an extended uh, string of attacks within Israel specifically designed to, uh, to win the election for, at that time, Benjamin Netanyahu, who was opposed to the Oslo Accords. That is exactly what they wanted to have happen, and it, they were successful. So it was clearly, it was not only vulnerable to spoilers, but it did not promise uh, a Palestinian state, as I said. It also did not... You know, one of the arguments that the Israeli right has made for many, many years, and they are correct, is that Oslo does not uh, bar settlement activity. There is a vague reference to sides not taking each side not taking unilateral steps uh, to change the status quo. But there is nothing in there that says Israel cannot expand its existing settlements, which is the argument Israel kept making when it was when it was doing that for a very long time gradually became bolder and bolder arguments about legalizing what were called illegal outposts, et cetera. But uh, 
if you if there is no mention in there of human rights or very little um there's no real emphasis there's nothing in it that uh that specifies that either israel or the palestinians have to respect human rights and in fact uh one of the reasons that uh yitzhak rabin this is a fairly famous story that rabin uh liked the idea of palestinians policing other Palestinians, because as he said, Palestinians can do it uh, which means uh, without the High Court of Justice, Israel's High Court of Justice, and without B'Tselem, which is in, uh, at the time was the major Israeli human rights group. His point was that the Palestinian Authority did not have to answer to such things, did not have to answer to its own judiciary and its own human rights movement. Uh, and those things would not be able to restrain them the way they were able to politically restrain somewhat uh, actions in Israel. And he was right. <laughs> um, that that was the basis of the Oslo Accords. So that's why it didn't work. Um, it was it was I would not I would not agree with some who say it was never designed to work. I do think, and I, I've spoken um, at, at times with a number of people who were involved in crafting the Oslo Accords, I think there was a sincere effort to make it work at the beginning. The talks that actually happened in Oslo, I think, were genuine. Uh, but I think once the Accords were actually crafted and the various political operatives and lawyers got involved, then I think it was it was pretty much dead on arrival. It was never, ever going to work. And instead, what we have is 25 years of, a, of an agreement that was meant to be temporary and has served no one, I, I would say, very well. I want to talk now about present day Palestine and in particular the Gaza Strip. The most moving part of this book, I thought, was your description of life there now today and quoting extensively from people who are barred from moving back and forth between the West Bank and Gaza, but also just the unbelievable poverty and suffering of Palestinians in Gaza. You note that 96% of the water is not drinkable, that electricity is only available for a few hours every day. The unemployment rate sometimes skyrockets above 50%. There's violence. And this really is, as you say, one of the worst humanitarian crises in, in the world. And it affects 2 million people. And yet there really is, I think, going to your thesis, except for Palestine, no widespread recognition of this horror, not certainly in the U.S. and not really by other countries either. And so, Mark, I was going to ask you first to respond. Why, why is that? Why is it except for Palestine? I, again, I think there are a few reasons. Again, I, I, we, I don't want to lose uh, track of this argument around Islamophobia. Uh, around uh, racism. It's very easy when you see famine in Africa to assume that that's just how it is because so much of our mind has been con constructed or, 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 or uh, shaped to believe that that's just the normal reality of these people, almost as if uh, there would be no other outcome. When we see violence in Chicago, gun deaths in Chicago over a weekend in the summer, and we, of course, we think it's awful and say, well, we think famine in, on the continent of Africa is awful. But there's part of uh, many of our minds that goes, well, that's kind of what they do. And so when we see the misery and the pain and the violence suffered by people in, in the Gaza Strip, it can sometimes be easy um, for people, not consciously necessarily, but subconsciously to believe that this is the kind of barbaric, violent world that they um, are accustomed to because it's their natural habitat. There's also an indifference to the suffering and the misery of people. Uh, who are black and brown around the world. And so, again, we have a different misery threshold when we watch the suffering of, of, of white folk versus black and brown folk. We have to be honest about that. Um, there are also political narratives that, that, that frame uh, what's happening in Gaza in particular. And again, it's bipartisan. 2016, you got uh, Donald J. Trump, you have Hillary Clinton. They're on stage and they're talking and they're debating and they're fighting on everything from taxes to, to, to offshore drilling, to environmental justice, to we go down the list and then you get to Palestine. By the second debate, they're on the same page. Hillary Clinton is saying Palestinians could have chosen paradise and instead they chose Hamas, right? The classic kind of APEC talking point. Uh, Trump is, 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 will not be outdone on, 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 on these talking points. And so they're, they're competing about who can, can, can be more anti-Palestinian. Um, and so, but those talking points are key because they become part of how we understand the problem. 
if we understand the problem as look, Israeli settlers left in 2005, they abandoned all the all, all the all the uh, greenhouses uh, and uh and, uh, and 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 left Palestinians to their you know they were relocated to other places, uh, and 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 they left uh, Palestinians to their own accord, and so anything you see in, in Palestine now, particularly in Gaza, is the result of Palestinians' own doing. What that ignores is that Israel continues to police the borders. They continue to border uh, uh, Gaza by land, air, sea, population registry, electromagnetic sphere. They control what goes in, they control what goes out. And so it's impossible to separate the conditions of Gaza from the overwhelming presence of the Israeli occupation. You know, and, and so what, and, and we, there'll be people who may debate the, the language of occupation, not in, not in the West Bank. I mean, I think that's indisputable, although some would argue, again, it's being administered, it's not being, or, you know, occupied. But when it comes to the Gaza, we're, we're talking about something slight, slightly different. But Fundamentally, whether you whether you nitpick on the word occupation, or not, although I do believe it satisfies the legal definition of an occupation, um, the point is is that Gazans have not had a moment of free rule. And while we may have critiques of Hamas, I have critiques of Hamas, and same way I have critiques of the Sultan, so the, the Palestinian Authority. Um, my more fundamental concern is the, the level of control exercised against Palestinian people in Gaza, and those factors are hidden through these narratives. So again. There are many people who are well-meaning in, in, in on the so-called left who might say, oh, what's happening in Gaza? Yeah, it's awful, but it's kind of their own fault. Or, you know, it's really a shame what Hamas is doing to those people, as opposed to having a more nuanced and rigorous discussion about the role that Israel and the United States and Egypt, right, because there's a Rafah border as well, uh, what, what role they play in all of this, right? But again, to not ignore the power relationships of all, the, all three of those countries. And so I think that's why we see um, this awful humanitarian crisis in Gaza uh, not inspire or, or, or evoke the same kind of outrage and pain and, and, and sadness and, and empathy um, that other places do. Mitchell, did you want to add anything to what Mark said? I, I actually, I think Mark's answer was, was very comprehensive. Um, I do, I would just add that um, one of the things about Gaza, Gaza has always been uh, a poor, it, it's resource poor. It has always been uh, a, a poor area, even before, even before 1948. Um, it was done no favors at all uh, when it was uh, held in isolation largely by Egypt from 1948 to 1967. You know, people often say, well, why do you only talk about Israel? Well, we only talk about Israel because Egypt did, Egypt did very badly. It is about changing the situation. And um, so Egypt's, uh, Egypt's role, which is very real, Egypt began a, a, the de-development process in Gaza uh, while, it was, while it was controlling it, but Israel has accelerated that. And Israel has taken measures that have made it much, much worse, especially in the last 15 or so years, um, by building a wall around it, by isolating it, by laying siege to it, by calling it a, an, an enemy territory. Um, it uh, and, and you know I would reinforce that it is absolutely still under occupation. Yes. Uh, in 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 uh, in legal terms, it doesn't look like an occupation because there's no Israelis inside of it. Um, right. But um, you know if you if if Gaza was truly free, they should be able to walk up to their border without having to worry about getting shot. Um, in fact, they cannot do that. Um, it, there's, I mean, they, they should be able to run their ports. They should be able to import and export whatever they want. They cannot do any of that. Their economy has been devastated. Uh, their infrastructure largely destroyed. And, um, you know, why do we tolerate, part of why I think we, we tolerate that state of affairs in, you know, on top of the reasons Mark has already laid out, is that, as I say, Gaza has always been poor, and it's always been a place, uh, because it's been poor, it's always been the place of Palestinian radicalism. It's been the place where um, uh, a lot of Palestinian, and that when I say radicalism, I'm not just talking about violence, um, although certainly there are violent groups in, in, in Gaza, um, 
I, it, it has just been a place of radical thought and um, in, in every sense of that word. And so I think people therefore are, uh, are have an easier time being afraid of it and, and ignoring it. Um, and also just because Gaza being a poor uh, sort of decrepit place in the image of the West is, is the norm. It's been that way for so long. So I think when you put all that together with, uh, with Mark's points, this is how you get a, a, an exception, particularly for Gaza, where we're talking about a humanitarian crisis that, you know, right now Yemen has surpassed it because of our, in, in great measure, because of our own policies. Um, but Gaza has been going on like this for a very, very long time. And when the UN said it was going to be uninhabitable in 2020, they were actually right. Um, it has actually come to pass. People cannot live there in any uh, 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 decent way. Um, they are barely getting by and that because of what little aid can get through to them. So um, it, it is a far greater crisis, yes, than, than it is treated in our political discourse. I'm going to turn now to the audience questions of which there are many. And Mark, I'm going to start with you. This question asks, what do you think about the argument that if the Palestinians had simply remained and supported a democratic state, they would have a significant voice today? If the Palestinians had what? Simply remained and supported a democratic state. Remained when? In 1948? I'm just trying to remain when? I'm, I'm going to insert 1948. It's not there, but I'm assuming that that's what the question's referring to. The, the reason I say that is, is only because there, there's one of, the, one of the most refuted at this point narratives um, about Palestinians is that somehow in 1948, they all, that the 700 plus, the 700 plus thousand Palestinians decided to pick up, pack their bags and leave cities uh, thinking this would be a quick war or, or leaving, thinking out of some kind of arrogance, you know, like, like, a, like a Brooklyn Nets fan who's up by 20 and loses the game, you know, it, that, that this was somehow uh, evidence of that. Basically, again, Palestinians are to blame for their own oppression. Um, when we subject those claims to any historical scrutiny, and of course, there's an entire tradition of uh, Palestinian historians known, or, or historians of Palestine is probably a better way of putting it. Um, many of them are actually Israelis, some, some, some of them are Zionists even, uh, but there's an entire cadre of historians known as in the, uh, the uh, revisionist historians uh, or new historians, excuse me, who engage in a form of historic revisionism um, where, they, where they're actually understanding it within better terms with, with complete evidence that Palestinians weren't, um, that, that, you know, that these weren't preemptive wars. I'm sorry, that, that, that these weren't defensive wars and that Palestinians didn't just pack up and leave, et cetera. And so I would, I would um, and so when you read people like Benny Morris, when you read Avi Schleim uh, and, and others, we, we see this. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm, I'm sort of rejecting the premise of the question on its face, right? Which is if Palestinians had just not tucked, you know, uh, you know, uh, tucked in their tails and ran, you know, and, and they had just chosen democracy, they'd be fine. It's like, no, the plan, and we talk about this in the book, you know, um, the plan was clearly understood by, by many, uh, many leaders in the Zionist movement. I mean, if you read the work of, of, of uh, Zev Javit Jabotinsky, for example, he's very clearly saying, look, these people are indigenous and they're not going to give up their land freely and easily. No people would, right? No people of any dignity, of any pride, no people uh, of any courage or valor would. Why would we expect them to do that, right? The way to defeat them is to crush them, right? And so by build this, this sort of iron wall principle is important when, when, when we hear people suggesting somehow that if only uh, Palestinians had chosen democracy, had stayed, that they'd be fine. But the second part of that is about choosing democracy. That Democracy wasn't on the table. Democracy was on the table within the context of those who would be citizens of the Jewish state. But again, as the new historians talk about, so much of the, the, this, the, the project of building a new state um, was also inclusive of a, of, of, of a goal of, tr of transfer, of, of removing Palestinians from the land, of, of isolating people or out, outside of the context of this newly formed state. This, this was not about sharing land. This was about um, creating something in a place where there was indigenous population that was that was that was a problem. Um, and, and, and so there was no democracy to choose. But if you look at um, most of the moments 
where there were significant clashes. You know, we could look at 1929. We could look at certainly the Arab revolts uh, of the 1930s, uh, 1936 specifically, um, that three-year period. Um, There are a bunch of moments where we've seen clashes between um, the uh, Yeshuv, the the pre-1948 Jewish community, and the Palestinians or the Arab population, uh, however, you know, the language is used in the historical juncture, um, who were there. And when they're battling it out and there's considerable problems, the the British, who didn't give a, in my estimation, didn't really give a damn who, they want an empire on the cheap, right? They, they, their goal was to control the Middle East. Um, when they did investigations to figure out what the problem was, and, 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 and you look at all the white papers, all the reports, the Shaw Commission report, the district report, all, 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 the, all the investigations suggest that the primary reason for the clashes was not because Palestinians didn't want Jewish people on the land or because they didn't, because they had some natural antipathy toward, toward, toward Jews. Remember, they, there had been peaceful coexistence for years. Again, I'm not saying there weren't pogroms. I'm not saying there hasn't been violence. I'm not saying there wasn't anti-Semitism. But there had been, there'd been Jewish, it, it, there's always been a Jewish presence there. And there had been peaceful coexistence for a long time. Well, the, what, what the problem was for the, for the Palestinian population at the moment was, uh, it, it, was it was around access to land, it was around access to jobs, access to capital. It was, it, was about, it was about what the new waves of immigration were doing to their own prosperity. That's what they were fighting over. They, they, they weren't fighting over Jewishness. They weren't battling against Jewish nationalism per se. They were, they, they were fighting against um, a set of arrangements that was undermining their ability to live and survive and thrive. Why is this important? Because it means that, again, they weren't choosing, they, they weren't voting against democracy. They were fine with one person, one vote. They were fine with, um, with peace. Um, the problem was, um, they were faced with a set of circumstances that were deeply challenging. And so I don't th- I, th- I think it, it, it's a kind of counterfactual hypothetical to 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 wrestle with the question of what Palestinians could have done or what would have happened had Palestinians uh, chosen a democracy or stayed on the land. But we have an opportunity right now in 2021 to choose democracy and stay on the land. And many of us and Mitchell has, has, has been very clearly uh and very clear and articulate about being sort of agnostic on the question of one versus two states um, and saying that that's up to the people who are the deciders. And I agree with that. But as at, at the philosophical level, I believe in one state. I believe in, in, in one person, one vote in a secular democratic state. I don't think that one Jewish person should leave Israel. I don't think one Jewish person should leave historic Palestine. I don't think one Palestinian should leave. I think we can find a way for peaceful coexistence as long as no one is committed to ruling over the other. That's choosing democracy. That's staying on the land. That's what I want to see. And I hope, I hope we can make that happen. So the questions are piling up in the chat and I want to be mindful of our time. So I'm going to go, Mitchell, to you with the next question. And of course, if you wanted to add anything onto Mark's answer, please feel free to do so. But if you could focus on this question, that would be great. The question is this, how did it become that criticizing the state of Israel is now equated with being anti-Semitic? So I think there, there's two aspects to this that, that, that I think are very, very important. And I think almost all of us tend to focus on only one or the other. One is that um, there is clearly a cynical effort at, 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 at work um, to shield um, Israel from criticism by, claiming, by collapsing the idea of anti-Semitism with the idea of criticism of Israel or even anti-Zionism. I think you know, one, of the, one of the problems is we keep asking, well, what sort of criticism of Israel is legitimate? Where is that line? There is no line. Criticizing Israel is fine. It, 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 even if it's harsh, even if it's unwarranted, even if it's incorrect, um, it, is as, it is as acceptable as criticizing the United States, criticizing Saudi Arabia, criticizing Niger, criticizing China, Russia, any other country. This is part of being a country. Your policies are scrutinized. Some people will like them. Some people will not. Some people will say terrible things about them. Some people will lie about them. That's, that's part of being a country. If you can't live with that, don't be a country. Mm-hmm. Um, so that... The, but one of the ways that um, that Israel uh, criticism of Israel is deflected, and look, it has to be. You can't 
have, on the one hand, a state that claims to embrace pluralistic, universalistic, democratic values, and on the other hand, has held, all the other things aside, has held um, millions of people without civil rights and without respecting their human rights for generations. Since 1967, we're talking, you know, we're talking 53 plus years. Um, that is that that is just those two things can't go together. And um, the only way to uh, to really debate that is to not debate it, but to attack the, the people uh, who are bringing that message. You know, Mark gets a ton of it. I get a lot of it. Mark gets more than I do. Um, but um, so there there is that aspect. Then there's but there is another side that I think is much more uh, much more genuine, I guess. And that is that for most Jews in the West these days, most of us are not religious. I, I was raised Orthodox, as I said, but I am completely secular at this, you know, have been since I was a teenager. Um, and most Jews are not religious. And if, uh, if you're not religious, and especially if you're not even traditional, what does it mean to be Jewish? And for many, many Jews, many Jews, whether it, and, that, and this includes religious Jews, Orthodox Jews, Reformed Jews, totally secular Jews, their Jewish identity is deeply and intimately wrapped up in Israel. And as a result, when Israel is criticized legitimately or otherwise, they f viscerally feel it as an attack on them as Jews. That's a real experience. It's not, you know, as I say, I, I do believe that on an organizational level, a lot of that, a lot of this stuff is cynical. But uh, certainly on an individual level, it is very real. It is a real experience that many Jews have, and it is difficult to deal with. And um, and it made all the more difficult if you are critical of uh, certain aspects of Israel's policies and behaviors, but you're being confronted with someone who is even more critical, you know, which is you know going to happen when somebody who is a you know relatively moderate two state, you know, sort of uh, uh, peacenik, uh, as we call them in, in the Jewish community, is confronted by someone who's fiercely pro-Palestinian. You know, they're, go they're going to hear a very harsh criticism and it's going to feel like they're being attacked as Jews, even if they're not. So I think there really is a, there, there's a very real thing there. And, you know, it's, it's very hard, you know, I'm not going to tell Palestinians how to speak about their oppression. And it's a little hard for me to tell, you know, when I when I go and if I'm going to a, a Palestinian refugee camp, as I have on numerous occasions, and I'm talking to people there, I'm not going to tell them, uh, you know, what I just said. And you have to remember this at all times when you're talking to, you know, and how, how this might make, uh, you know, a, a, a Jewish person feel. Um, because they're living in a very harsh circumstance. And, you know, this is a very high... Um, um, uh, very tense conversation. People's tempers run high. It, it, it's very emotional uh, and it's very visceral for a lot of people. So um, I, I, you know, I think where it's possible to try and understand that, that Jews sometimes feel these things in, in, a, in a way that maybe it's not intended, uh, that's real. I think it's made very, very difficult for people to do that when you have groups like ADL, groups like the American Jewish uh, Committee, groups like, uh, you know, or even, you know, even worse, groups like the Zionist Organization of America uh, or the Israeli government itself saying that even legitimate criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Um, you know, when, when Saturday Night Live can't make a joke about what is obviously a problem, um, uh, uh, when, when you know, Il, you know, Ilhan Omar gets attacked the way she does, Rashida, these are not political disagreements. They're immediately attacked personally. Um, that is a problem, and 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 it it should be lost on no one that I just named Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Michael Che. I can also include Mark Lamont Hill. I can include Angela Davis. I can include any number of people. And the thing they all have in common is none of those people I just named are white. Um, so there's that aspect to it as well, that uh, all of these things matter. And it complicates, as I say, a very real situation for many Jews who identify so strongly with Israel and, and just have a reaction. Um, you know, when they, when, they, when they hear these attacks, especially when those attacks are really, really harsh. And, and, you know, I think we also should not, you know, one other aspect, and then I'll 
you know, let us move on to the next question, but this is kind of a big one. Um, we should, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, Jews have done a great job in this country, particularly in other countries as well, but really in the United States of organizing politically. Um, and, you know, we have, uh, Jews have created um, a, a, a lobbying group, APAC, that is disproportionately powerful to any, to, to its issue and to, um, to its real role in American policy. Foreign policy is not something where you usually think about massive lobbying forces like something like the NRA. Uh, the NRA is, was, <laughs> thankfully, was uh, much better funded, um, really much more widespread uh, in, in, in its support across the country um, than APAC. But APAC wields amazing power on um on Capitol Hill, and that's not because they're Jewish, and it's not because they're a cabal or something like that. It's because they they worked really hard and they learned how to play the political game, and they did that. Well, that is true, but the problem is, is that we have therefore a one-sided political wave in Washington that can't be countered. And when that's put together with what I would consider disingenuous accusations of anti-Semitism, it makes people angry and they don't want to hear about what I just explained about the visceral reaction of Jews because they're getting called anti-Semites when they're criticizing some pretty bad behavior by an American ally. Um, and they're getting nowhere on Capitol Hill because of the power of, of APAC. APAC does not, and I want to stress this, does not uh, create U.S. policy. It does not uh, it, you know, I have a, an article uh, in the Middle East uh, uh, report that I wrote in 2014 that explains that, you know, the, the whole Israel lobby idea uh, is as, as a maker of policy is wrong, but as a framer of debate, it's very real. And as uh, an influencer in Congress, it's very real. So um, when we have all of these things together, the entire subject of anti-Semitism has become incredibly toxic and it's going to be really important. And I think we're starting to see this work in the Jewish community to pull it apart and to get through it and to say this is, you know, this is really anti-Semitism, partially because there's been coming uh, uh, almost an obsession to find anti-Semitism on the left when, sorry, overwhelmingly it exists on the right. So much of your answer resonated with me as a, as a secular Jew myself who um, attempted to celebrate Hanukkah recently and had my kids ask when it was time to blow out the candles <laughs> and who went to Israel with my older sister, Emily, who had lived there for a long time and just felt very, very powerfully all of a sudden, this sense of connection to this place where I had never been because for the first time in my life, everyone around me essentially was Jewish. And it was just this immediate emotional connection that I felt. And I think you do make a really important point when you say that institutions are cynical, but individuals are not. And that's part of, that's one of the many reasons why this is such a complicated conversation. Mm -hmm. So we only have time for one more question. And that means I left a lot of them in the chat. And I, I'm sorry, it's just such a fascinating topic that I think so many people wanted to ask you more questions, which is a good thing for, I think, people who want to find out more. They should absolutely read your book, which is my chance to say this is a very tautly written, fast, fascinating read, which is going to have you asking yourself some hard questions. So I thank you both for writing it. The last question really talks about the future because it's so easy to look at the past and look at decades and decades of intractable infighting and struggle and feel like it's kind of hopeless. And this questioner wants to know how younger voices can help address the larger problems that you're talking about. And I think in particular how more privileged populations, first world countries, including most especially ours, become really desensitized to brutality in, in other nations, whether it's, it's Africa or other countries, as Mark was referring to in a previous answer, or more specifically what's going on in, in Palestine and in the Gaza Strip. And I'm curious to know how each of you would exhort younger folk to step forward and take a leadership role and perhaps turn things in a different direction. So um, Mark, I was going to start with you. The first thing I think is, is realizing and recognizing that the world is indeed changeable. Um, 
it's easy to get locked in um, and to become prisoner of the moment, or as the great theologian Howard Thurman said, uh, prisoner of, of the event. Um, you can think that our vision, our dreams, our understandings of the world are all scaled down to the level of our immediate experience, when in fact, we can be so much broader than that. It's easy to believe that we can't get any freer, that we can't get any more rights, that the world can't get any more just than it is right now. But the evidence is, on, is against that. History is on our side. Imagine 20 years ago having a conversation about marriage equality. You know, my father was born in 1929. Black, he, black folk couldn't vote for the first 36 years of his life. He wasn't a full citizen for 36 years. But people went from picking cotton to picking presidents, right? I mean, there's a way that the world radically can shift. And on this question of Israel and Palestine, the fact that Mitchell and I can write a book like this at this juncture in history, the fact that Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib can run and successfully win office while advocating for Palestinian rights, the fact that Bernie and, and, and Elizabeth Warren can articulate the most progressive uh, vision uh, for Palestinian justice that we've ever heard from mainstream presidential candidates, not progressive enough, not where I want them to be. I have profound disagreements with both of them, but still far ahead of the pack. And the fact that they could do that and not lose the race because of that, they lost because of a whole bunch of reasons, but not that tells you that we're, we're moving somewhere. We're winning. We're winning. We got a whole world screaming Black Lives Matter. In 2016, we had presidential candidates on the Democratic side saying, well, not all lives matter. We're winning. So I begin from the place of saying we are winning. We are closer to freedom and justice than we've ever been before. So what do young people do in the, in, against the backdrop of that? Well, you keep fighting. You keep studying. The great Robin Kelly, one of the most important historians that, that this country's ever produced, uh, has a mantra of love, study, struggle. Love, study, struggle. I encourage all, everyone, not just the young folk, but everybody to engage in love, study, and struggle. First, you begin with a profound love. I have profound love for the human family. I love Palestinian people. I love my own people. I love my Jewish brothers and sisters. I even love Mitchell, though he's a Brooklyn Nets fan. I love, <laughs> I love everyone and I see everyone's humanity and I want everyone to be free. So you got to begin with profound love for the people. Study. We live in a moment that so, can be so profoundly anti-intellectual. We need to understand this issue. I tell young people, read about this issue. Don't Google it. Don't TikTok it. Don't just go buy memes. Actually read the books. And Mitchell and I have an episode of Coffee and Books where we, we lay out about maybe 20, if not more, books on the subject to get people started on this. When you read our book, except for Palestine, read the references, read the read the bibliography, read all of it. And then struggle. What does struggle look like? Struggle takes place in the voting booth. Struggle takes place on the picket line. Struggle can take place in a popular boycott. Struggle can take place with an important book. Struggle can take place with a lecture and a debate. Struggle takes place in all kinds of areas, but find your space. Love, study, struggle. And when you do, I promise we'll be even closer to freedom than we are now. That is a beautiful note to end on. And Mitchell, I'm sorry I didn't get your final answer, but we're a bit over time. I want to thank both of you so much for this conversation today and also just for contributing a very important book to a topic that is both seemingly intractable and yet holds glimmers of hope and is endlessly fascinating. So thank you both so much. This book is available wherever books are sold, although hurry up because some of the indie outlets are actually running out of copies. Hopefully they'll restock and they thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today at this online Commonwealth Club event. And thank, and thank you, you so Laura, much, Mark for doing this, doing this with us. It's a real honor to have you hosting this discussion.